Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Thomas Asbridge, who is Senior Lecturer in Medieval History at Queen Mary in London. He has just published a major new history of the Crusades, unique for the way it tells the story from both Christian and Muslim perspectives. When Pope Urban proclaimed the First Crusade in 1095, he was taking one of the most momentous steps in Christian history. Yet in 1095, there was no such thing as a crusade to hark back to in order to muster support. There was no blueprint for crusading. So I began by asking Thomas, what did the Pope think he was doing exactly? Well, I think in part he was building upon some precedent. Um, one of his recent predecessors, a Pope called Gregory the Seventh, had experimented with ideas of sanctifying violence, making violence potentially a, a holy activity, and also experimented with the idea of what we might call a papal army, an army that would serve the interests of the papacy. But I think Gregory's mistake was that he made himself too closely identified with this. He actually said he was going to lead this army and it really was going to do the work of the papacy. Um, and he failed dramatically. There was a, there was a classic and uh, wonderfully enlightening letter where he says to someone, come and join me on this expedition. There are going to be 60,000, you know, I've already got 60,000 people coming. Uh, it's almost like a party invite, you know, come, you know, I've got these other great people coming to the party as well. And it's a complete lie. He, he basically got no one to come on this expedition and it was a, a real flop. So I think in Urban's mind, he knows that he's building, a, he's got some precedent to work from because the Middle Ages is, and very much in the late 11th century is a period where novelty is, is looked upon uh, with a rather frowning gaze, I would say. But I think he's also refining that precedent because he doesn't try to in, play himself so heavily into the event. He doesn't say he's going to lead the expedition. He doesn't say it's going to be a papal army. It's going to be something that's going to serve the interests, the wider interests of Christendom. And the way he packages it is to say, yes, this is going to be an armed force, but it's going to be an armed pilgrimage. It's going to have a particular goal, one that's going to resonate with his audience. And that goal is going to be Jerusalem, the holy city of Jerusalem, which at this date was the, the most sacred site in the Christian cosmos. I think alongside that, we can argue that he is thinking he's going to serve the interests of the papacy. He is, I would envisage him as someone who has maybe is trying to fulfill a number of objectives through one action. So yes, he's trying to bring back the, the Holy Land to Christendom. I think he is trying to give an opportunity to uh, the Christians of Europe to find a new path to salvation because the, the, the big hook that he's offering is that by participating in this, what we now call a crusade, by participating in this expedition, they are going to receive uh, a rem what we call a remission of sin. Their sins are going to be cleansed in one way or another. But I also think he's, he is thinking he's going to serve the interests of the papacy. It's going to make the authority of Rome felt across Europe. And it's going to inculcate in people a sense that if the papacy calls for an action, uh, they should listen. And I think that's an important part of his message. So he's got an objective or a set of objectives, and he's got an offer, if you like, in terms of absolution from sin. So who is he principally aiming this message at? Who is he hoping to attract? I think it's a very interesting question because it, it plays into the debate about how much he really knew about what was going to happen. And some historians have argued that when he preached uh, this famous sermon at Clermont uh, in November 1095, really all he was expecting was a few hundred people, perhaps a, and, and probably a few hundred knights, to enlist and go off and help the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Christian Empire. I'm less convinced of that. I don't think he had such small expectations, such limited expectations, in part because we know that he contacted some key individuals who were going to be involved before uh, actually speaking at Claremont. He laid the ground. And he also carried out a very extensive preaching campaign after Claremont, touring across France to broadcast the message. So I think he, I think he expected thousands. I think he expected uh, and hoped for quite a rapturous response. And I think he, I think he constructed his, his sermon and his message around that expectation because one of the things he did was to seek to demonize an enemy, to use the, this, this idea of an enemy other, uh, a group that had to be attacked, that had to be repelled. And, and it was Islam that he chose as that enemy. So yes, I think he thought there was going to be there would be thousands, but perhaps not tens of thousands. And there's a lot of academic debate about exactly how many First Crusaders there were. And unless we discover new evidence, we'll never know the answer. But I think, uh, by my estimation, at least we're looking at an army of fifty to 60,000 people in all its waves. And I do think he was probably astonished by that, by that number. 
so far we've been talking from the Western perspective, but something which makes your book unique is the fact that you also look at it from the Muslim perspective. Tell me a bit about your decision to do that and how, how it actually works in the book. Well, I've been writing the book for about the last six years, and I, and I have to admit that it wasn't my first impulse. I came to this thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm going to write a, a general history of the Crusades, and I mapped out quite carefully, you know, which elements of the Crusades I was going to cover, and I'd started writing some of some of those even before I started to, to become uneasy about the, the perspective that I was putting on to these events. In my previous book on the First Crusade, I tried to write a history that was balanced, that was even-handed in terms of the way it presented Christian activity and Muslim activity. But it's very difficult to write a, a really balanced history of the First Crusade because the Muslim sources don't survive. Uh, we have very little textual evidence from uh, an Islamic point of view on that particular event. And it started to dawn on me that uh, in terms of what I was, re everything else I was reading on the First Crusade that's written by Western historians in this modern period, uh, and what I was planning to write myself, all of it was colored by a, a fairly distinct form of bias. In that even if I said I was going to be even-handed, if I was writing from a Western perspective, if I talked about a battle, and I talked about the outcome of that battle, if it was a, a victory for the Latins, for the, the Christians, I would use the word victory. I wouldn't describe it, I would describe it perhaps as a, you know, an amazing achievement. And I realized that if you looked at it from the other perspective, of course, it could be an absolutely crushing defeat, or as we, as we see in the history of the Crusades, um, there are many victories for the Muslim world. And I wanted to, to show uh, a reader that there were different ways of viewing the Crusades, and that, that there were two very, very powerful forces involved in this uh, historical period, and that it was possible to come at it from different directions. And because of the scope of the book, because it covers not just the First Crusade, but covers crusading all the way to 1291, so in best part, two centuries of history. Once we get into the later 12th century, the Muslim sources become much more illuminating, and it, it becomes possible then to actually talk about what is in the minds of Muslim leaders, how does Islam actually regard this, this struggle. And so I set about breaking the book up into five parts, uh, starting off in part one with the First Crusade and the, the foundation of the Crusader states from the Christian perspective, but then switching, I hope, fairly dramatically in part two, in the second half of the 12th century, to the perspective of Islam. And I carry on in the book, switching back and forth in these different parts. And the only part, uh, the only section of the book that where I'm, I mingle the two is in the Third Crusade, which I, I think really is the, the heart of the book. It's where I've done some of the most original research for the book. And in that section, I, I break between chapters from the perspective of Saladin, the, the key Muslim leader at the time of the Third Crusade, uh, and the perspective of Richard the Lionheart, 15th century. 